Now we're going to see the last topic in one dimensional plasticity, which is a plastic dissipation. Some quantity C, which is a plastic like PIB. Uh, and we can compute it as a quadratic form in terms of the elastic strain or elastic energy and the plastic um, energy. Here we have your modulus. This is a, a, a plastic modulus. As I said before, it is some string like. Elastic stored energy per unit volume. And this term here is plastic. In order to have this energy, we need an elastic plastic process. So let's assume a one dimensional isotropic hardening, just for simplicity, <clears throat> elastic plastic process. So, as usual, we, we tend to see everything from the geometry. Say we go all the way to the last branch. And since we're assuming um, isotropic hardening, and we have our linear, bilinear, elastic plastic model so in one dimension, here we're gonna do something like that. So we go from A to B. Now we have the question, what is the total energy once we're here? How do we compute the energy? Total energy is nothing but an area under the curve ABC, right? So energy equal to the area under ABC, which is equal also to sigma 
to the integral of sigma times the epsilon. Right? So we can also express this integral like the function of time, the integral of sigma epsilon dot dt. That's right. But this is a total energy here. But what about these guys? What is the stored elastic energy up to this, po this point? And what is the plastic stored energy? Who wants to, who wants to make a guess? Elastic energy is going to be the area under AB. No. So let's imagine I want to go back from C to a, a state of stress where I have no stress. So what will I, what would the material do? The material will come parallel, right? So this one is going to be parallel to that one. To this point. This is and this is one. And this is the elastic storage energy. The corresponding plastic storage energy. So this is A1 and this is A2. This is the elastic. But the total energy is all this area under the curve. So from here, we can see that this is going to be greater or equal than A1 plus A2. number here, this value. Well, this is elastic spring. This is plastic spring. And this is going to be the total spring. So this number here is nothing but elastic strain times the young model, which implies that this triangle, the area of this triangle is one half this times this. So E epsilon elastic squared. Now let's take a look to the plastic storage energy. So we can make a graph figure for this, that one, for this one, in terms of C, right? Or EP, epsilon P. And here we have sigma Y naught. Like here. So since this is epsilon p, we're going to be doing something like that. This is 
plastic stored energy. And this is H prime times C, the corresponding area of one half H prime C squared. So since we have this triangle taking all the uh, elastic energy and this one accounting for all the plastic energy, what is this empty uh, trapezoidal something like that that we have there? This is the dissipated energy. It were monotonically loading here. This is equal to that one, right? And I can compute this from the time integral of this guy, which is going to be always greater or equal than zero, as we can see here or here. So here, if we hypothetically go back to zero, and then we load again, we'll keep increasing this guy here, right? Once we reach it, this point again, we'll keep going, going, going. So this guy always is increasing monotonically. So this is, sorry, this is monotonically increasing. And this guy here is nothing but the absolute value of the, of the plastic strain rate, which is at the same time nothing but the plastic multiplier. the power, how do I get the power? Power is the time derivative of the energy, right? The rate of change of energy. So the rate of change of the energy from this expression here is what? The time derivative of this integral, it shows what we have inside. So sigma epsilon dot greater or equal than a1 dot plus a2 dot. And here there are, we have a1 and a2. If we compute the time derivative of these guys here, what do we get? <coughs> We get that sigma epsilon dot minus We can compare this to this energy that 
we define it in the beginning. So if we replace this for the time derivative of that, what do we get is sigma dot minus the time derivative of the free energy with respect to time is greater or equal than zero. And this is defined as the dissipation. Right here. Or this one. And this is called the inequality or maybe someone has already seen this inequality somewhere no? it's also called the Clausius Planck inequality Wow. Real quick, on the energy, it looks like the uh, part of the plastic energy is being double counted with the elastic energy. Double? No, no, no. That's why here it is the basis will be epsilon plastic, right? Here, that's why I'm doing this figure here in terms of C. In this case, okay. I can relate epsilon plastic okay. to C, right? In this case, it yeah. will be the yeah. same. So I can derive this Clausius Planck inequality for those who have taken a continuum mechanics course before directly from the second law of thermodynamics. It is a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. I can derive all the way the pairing or going from the second law of thermodynamics arrive to this inequality. But here we have made a geometric derivation, which takes us to the same place. But this, in fact, is a thermodynamical uh, requirement. Okay, so we still want to keep going with this inequality and see what else can we get from it. Keep squeezing this to get in something else. To do that, let's recall that we had, as always, or that we can, using the additive decomposition, we can write elastic strain in terms of the total strain minus elastic strain, right? And therefore, the rates. Also, from the hardening law, we can get that sigma y is equal to sigma y zero, or not, times h prime c. From where we get that h prime c is equal to sigma y minus sigma y naught. And then we can replace this guy and this guy substitute back here, here, and here. And what we will get is Right. 
Now collecting terms, for instance, we can rewrite this expression as We are in a quasi-static process, and we are assuming Hooke's law. I know that sigma minus Q modulus time the elastic deformation is equal to zero, right? So this guy goes away, and this becomes sigma. So sigma epsilon plastic dot minus I also know that C dot is equal to lambda dot. And I can use the flow rule for this. So Instead of this, I substitute by the flow rule, and this derivative is nothing by, but the sign of the signal. Collecting terms I have this. And what is this? Remember that we are we're here, right? this point C, which means we are yielding. So this is equal to zero, which implies sigma y naught times gamma dot greater or equal. This is called the reduce dissipation. So dissipation is equal to zero only in two cases, right? If, if sigma y naught is equal to zero, which means not elastic strength at all, so I flow the material and it 
exposing to plasticity right away. Or if lambda dot is equal to zero, which means elasticity. This is the end of the uh, 1D plasticity. From now on, we're going to study only um, 3D or 2D, for some cases, uh, plasticity. Any questions? Before going into the 3D plasticity, we know some uh, basic or general definitions. So, so far we've been pulling this bar with a one-dimensional stress sigma. And now we're going from this to that where we have here and a stress in this direction. Right. Here a different stress independent from that one in this direction. And here the same thing. So three directions. We're going from one to three different directions. And let's assume that there is no shear stress here. In fact we only have this three so with this, we can create an orthogonal space of a stress with three different and independent directions, right? So There's no problem with having shear stresses, though, right? No, no, no. But uh, we we haven't talked about the like no. diagonalization. You mean in eigenvalues, eigenvectors? Well, it's like, I just want to make sure you can still have shear stresses. No, no. Know. But once you have shear stress, you can still take it, rotate it in yeah, such a way that you, you can take it to yeah, only okay. to this. Okay. So I, I want I didn't want okay. to talk about that, <laughs> but we will be talking about that. And sigma three. The origin. And there is a special place, a very important place here inside of this whole space. It's this axis where sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3. We call it the hydrostatic axis. It's called the hydrostatic axis. This line or axis where sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 and is equal to sigma 3. So, for instance, we have unique vectors here. We 
have this angle with respect to the sigma three axis that we call theta. And at the bottom, right through the origin, we have a plane called the pi plane, which is orthogonal to the hydrostatic axis. No sigma one equal to sigma two equal to sigma two. So this this pi plane is orthogonal to this axis, is perpendicular to the axis, and contains The origin. This plane we call, or is the so called pi plane. Now, if we plot this line here, where sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 against the sigma 3, we're going to be able to see some things better. This is sigma 1 equal to sigma 2. And this is sigma 3. This is the hydrostatic axis. At 1. This is this goes over to 2. And this is 6. So from here we, we see that cosine of theta is 1 over the square root of 3, which gives us a fetal angle similar to 54.7 at the hydrostatic axis. This also implies that this unit vector here, normal to the pipeline, has coordinates this way. This is then the unit vector parallel to hydrostatic axis or normal to the pipeline. And where is the pipeline in this figure here? Okay. This guy here. Perpendicular to. And we can project points from the sigma three axis on the pipe plane here. And we call this point sigma three pi. With a little bit of geometry, it's not difficult to see that this is theta. So sigma three pi which is sigma 3 projected on the pi plane is equal to sine of theta sigma 3.
but we know that sine of theta is the square root of two thirds, which gave us symmetry pi equal to the square root of two thirds sigma three, or similar to 0 0.82 sigma three, with the distortion factor less than one. So that means that every state of stress that we project in the sigma three case, we project on the side plane, is gonna look smaller, it's gonna be the 82% or less <coughs> than the original case. Finally, a more general definition for the pipe plane will be the pipe plane is the geometric place of a set of points whose coordinates are sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, such that sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to zero. This is the general definition for the pipeline. This, we can finally go to the J2 yield criterion. But before refining this, we still need some extra tools. As always, we need an additive decomposition. But this time, not in a strain, but in a stress. with an additive decomposition for this guy, for the Cauchy stress. Which in this case is not a scalar quantity anymore, but is a, this is a stress tensor, second order tensor, right? So how can I decompose it additively? What's the additive decomposition for that guy? Yeah. You know, but that is the composition. So I can so I can make it into a volumetric part plus a deviatoric part. So this is the volumetric and this is the deviatoric. This volumetric part is nothing but the pressure times the second order identity. And the pressure is one third of the trace of sigma. So 
a question. What's the trace of S? What's the value of the trace of S? Zero. The Vettori tensor doesn't have a trace. So this is the intrinsic notation, but we can also rewrite this in the index notation, writing this like sigma ij is equal to p times delta ij plus sij. Or this delta ij is this second order identity, or also so called Kronecker delta, which is 1 when i equals to j and 0 otherwise, or i j from 1, 2 to 3. Why, why am I using lowercase for the index? What's the definition of Cauchy stress? How is Cauchy stress defined? The force in the form configuration over the area in the form configuration, right? So you also have the pure Kirchhoff configuration the first pure acute cover stress, where I have I, J, just like that. So this is uppercase. What's the meaning of this, this stress? This is also called the engineering stress. This is the first pure acute cover stress. So here I have the force in the form configuration, and the area is and the form, the original configuration. And the second pure acute cover stress that is also called S sometimes is I, J. So this is, the force and the area are in the form configuration, but somehow translated into the original configuration. So these are the three most popular ways of measuring stress. Cauchy stress, which means force in the form configuration and area in the form configuration. Piola Kirchhoff stress, which means form, a force in the form configuration and area in the original configuration. The second pillar, which is the weirder of them, the weirdest of them, which means force and area in the form configuration but taken back to the original configuration, which is kind of weird, weird to understand. So what is a, a feature of this Cauchy stress? It's symmetric. It's symmetric. And that implies, what are the implication of, implications of having a symmetric? Sigma what? Ij equals sigma ji. Oh yeah, well, well, that's, that's symmetry, right? Correct. That's symmetry. But what else? Well, well, if this is symmetric. It has six independent variables. Yeah, six. <laughs> what else? Besides that. Are you giving it S is also symmetric? Is it? Yeah, yeah. But just talking about this guy, I'm going to have real eigenvalues, right? So I'm going to have real eigenvalues. And what else in terms of the eigenvectors? If the eigenvalues are real, the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Orthogonal. 
eigenvectors. So Cauchy's stress is always symmetric. What about the first PLF curve? That one doesn't have to be symmetric. And the second PLF curve is always symmetric as well. And now we're going to build or get our yield function. We're talking about the shape to model thing. Now we have a gel function, the function of this Cauchy stress and some constant kappa equal to the, the L2 norm of S, which is the, remember, the deviatoric part of sigma minus kappa in less or equal than zero. So this is the yield function corresponding to the J2 model, so forth. So S, the L2 norm of the deviatoric part of the stress, is the square root of S double contracted with itself. And this double contraction in index notation means Sij, Sij. And this norm, norm of the deviatoric part of the Cauchy stress as an invariant. What's the meaning of an invariant? Why this kind of quantities are called invariant? Isn't there a coordinate It doesn't depend on the, on the kind of coordinate that you're using. It could be like orthogonal, you can rotate it, you can switch it to non-orthogonal coordinates. This value is gonna be always the same. That means invariant. It doesn't depend on coordinates. Some people think that invariant means that as you keep going with the mechanical process, this value is not going to change. That, that, is, that isn't true. That's going to change. If you keep increasing your load or decreasing, this is going to change. But if you rotate, it doesn't change. Or use a different frame of reference, it doesn't change. And in this terms, we can define the second uh, invariant of the of the deviatory part of the Cauchy stress. And that second invariant is called the J2 invariant, which is defined as one half of the L2 norm of S squared. So this is the second invariant of the deviatory part of the Cauchy stress, which is called the J2 How many invariants do these second order uh, tensors have in general? Three. Three. Three eigenvalues are basically three variants, and you can express them in other ways. So I can rewrite the yield function in terms of J2. So 
Now my air pollution is going to look like Kappa in this case is constant and can be related to is related <coughs> or similar to sigma y in one dimension. In fact, knowing sigma y, I can compute kappa and the other way around. With the yield function, we can now define an elastic region. <coughs> this elastic region is the set of a state of the stress sigma such that sigma belongs to R6. So six independent components, right? This is a symmetric second order tensor, so it has six independent components. And F sigma kappa is the Zorico This is the state of the last region. means 6 times 1 vector space. Now an important property convexity of the last equation. Let's assume, let's imagine that This is my elastic region. And inside this elastic region, I have two states of the stress sigma 1 and sigma 2. Since I'm living in a vector space, if I want to take my system from sigma 1, to, from the state sigma 1 to the state sigma 2, I should go in this straight line, right? And we can see that this straight line, all the points are going to be inside or are going to belong to the elastic region. So here, all points in the elastic region. It will happen if I do this, 
If I go here, if I approach a boundary, it will, it will keep happening. I will never go outside of that situation. But what if I have a non convex last friction? I want to take my system from state one to state two. I want to go from sigma one to sigma two. And then we'll go through this straight line. But some states are going to be outside of the elastic region. And remember, because of the flow rule, we can never go outside of the state region. We can go at most at the boundary, but not further. So this kind of non-convex elastic regions are going to give me, if I am solving it in my code in the computer, I'm running a, a code that takes the bar from sigma 1 to sigma 2, they're going to give me solutions that aren't actually physical. So I really need to test for convexity. Let's assume that given sigma 1 and sigma 2, so a state of stress that belong to the elastic region, we say that this elastic region is convex if any. Sigma star state is a linear combination or can be expressed as a linear combination of these two guys. So n sigma 1 plus uh, 1 minus n sigma 2. And this belongs elastic or n in zero one. So just as I said here, I should go following this line from sigma one to sigma two. So I should be able to express any state of the stress as a linear combination of the two. And if such a state of the stress belongs to the elastic region, I might say that the elastic region is in fact convex. So I can also express the deviatoric part or compute the deviator part of this um, sigma star as sigma star minus one third of the trace of sigma times identity, which can also be written as um, n is one plus one minus n is two. As a linear combination of the deviatoric parts of sigma one and sigma two. Now let's assume that I have yield functions for these two guys here. 
so that f of sigma 1 kappa and f of sigma 2 kappa are less or equal than 0. So I want to compute the yield function for sigma star kappa which is going to be equal to the L2 norm of S star minus kappa. But I already know S star. This guy here. So, M is 1 plus 1 minus M is 2. Norm. Now, using the triangle inequality, I can express this less or equal than m times is 1 plus 1 minus n plus times the, the, the norm of s2 minus kappa. And now I add n kappa and subtract n kappa and nothing happens, right? So I can rewrite that one, that expression. Massaging it a little bit as um, n times is 1 minus kappa plus 1 minus n times is 2, the norm minus kappa. Right. And what is this? And what is that? This is F1, F the sigma 1, and that one is the yield function of sigma 2. Is that right? So since I'm assuming that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are in the elastic region, then these yield functions are always smaller or equal than, than 0. And this n at 1 plus n, since n belongs to 0, 1, also going to be that way. This is a linear combination of two things that are less or equal to 0. So this is going to be less or equal to 0. I'm talking about this the function, which implies that convex means that the, the yield function of this linear combination of two any stress, the state of stress, of stress inside the elastic region is less or equal than zero, which at the same time implies that sigma star belongs to the elastic. Star instead of trace over there in the record. Maybe, yeah. Here? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Questions? There is 
no question. That's it for today. Yes, I'm free to go. So we've shown that if it's convex, then uh, it has to be in the elastic region. Mm -hmm. This is a local proof. This is not a local level proof. We're proving that locally, at least in this part of the elastic region, we have convexity. Locally. Okay. This is not a global proof, if that's what okay. you know, you're going to. So elastic region has to be convex. It has to be convex. Otherwise, you get these kind of build solutions. It doesn't make any sense. Because I feel like we assumed it was convex and we showed that it no, has to be an elastic. The region. only thing that we assume is that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are inside the elastic region, right. are members of the elastic region. So everything that holds for that elastic region holds for them. And everything that holds for that elastic region is nothing but the yield ah. function. And then we prove that sigma star is in the elastic, in the elastic okay. region.